Hi, I'm Maya. Hi, I'm Georgia. And, and this is Ningaloo Outlook. Georgia and I are university students who share a love of books, the beach, and most of all, turtles. Especially if they're tiny. Travel with us deep below the waves to explore what hidden treasures lie among the reef, whales, turtles and fauna. A special thanks to CSIRO, Woodside and the Ningaloo Reef Research Team for chatting with us about the magic of the reef. So let's dive into it. So we are here today with Anna Creswell, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Anna completed her PhD on Ningaloo Reef with the CSIRO. Hi, thanks for coming in to have a chat with us. Thanks very much for having me. Anytime. Anytime. Happy to have you. So, as we said earlier, you did your PhD on the Ningaloo Reef. What was your PhD's focus? So my PhD looked at the resilience of coral reefs. So we can think of resilience as the ability of a coral reef or any ecosystem to withstand a disturbance and its capacity to recover from a disturbance. So I was really interested in these processes and how they occurred at Ningaloo Reef. So with your PhD, did you find that you spent more time in the field or was it more on land doing more theoretical type stuff? Yeah, so a bit of both. I think when people think of marine scientists, they can have this very magical view that we spend a lot of time swimming around on the reef. (laughs) (laughs) And I did get to do a lot of that uh, on the Ningaloo Outlook project and we had annual trips to the reef where we would survey all sorts of different things, look at how much coral is there, what types of fish and how many And then I also looked at things like coral growth rates and survival rates. And so these types of data are really important for understanding some of the processes that I wanted to um, model. So Mm. these ideas of resilience and impact and recovery from disturbance. But I'd say, yeah, probably 90% of the time I spent on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Just looking at pretty pictures of pretty the Ningaloo pictures Reef. Them, yes. <laughs> yes. But it's those field trips that make it all worth it and yeah. Yeah, yeah. allow you to kind of give a reality check to the things that you're looking at on your computer. See them mm. in real life. Work yeah. out what makes sense and what doesn't. Yeah. Definitely. And so what made you want to do your PhD sort of on the Ningaloo Reef? So uh, Ningaloo is a place that tends to keep drawing me back. I actually first visited Ningaloo when I was 10 years old. Wow. Uh, My dad had some friends who had a tour company up there and so on my 11th birthday I swam with a whale shark for the first time. Oh wow. Oh I could never, I'm too scared. (laughs) (laughs) So that was a pretty amazing experience and um, these friends of ours said well come back uh, when you've finished school and we'll give you some work. So I returned after I'd finished school and worked as a tour guide for about six months. Oh, Mm -hmm. wow. And then I went back to Tasmania, which is where I'm from, and did my degree in marine science. Yeah. Uh, So when I saw this PhD with the Ningaloo Outlook project advertised, it seemed like a really great opportunity to return to the reef as a scientist and start to understand it all better. Yeah. Yeah. And so how long did your PhD run for? I think it took about four years. Oh, wow. So we aim for three and a half years. I think I was probably close to that, but it is a long haul. Mm. Um, In the PhD, I had four main subjects that I was looking into. So each Mm -hmm. of those formed a chapter. And Mm. my PhD was quite diverse in that each of the chapters looked at something quite different but all in the same theme of coral resilience and how well will the reef do into the future. Yeah. Obviously when you start a PhD you don't really know like what to expect Mm -hmm. kind of with your research but when you've completed it were you kind of did it go where did it go where you're expecting it to go or was it kind of exceed that or not really or it switched halfway kind of Yeah, so I mentioned that I ended up with some quite diverse topics and I think when I first started they seemed very connected, um, seemed like they're all related and things, but with a PhD I think you you dive into one topic and you realise that it's way more complicated than you first thought. (laughs) So, um, for example, 
uh, one of my chapters looked at coral growth on the Ningaloo Reef. Yeah. I looked at three different species of corals and how fast they grow. So we would return to the same coral colonies each year and, and oh, take yeah. photos of them to see how much bigger they've got and whether they'd survived the year. Yeah, cool. Um, but if you think about it, then that's just three species out of many different species yeah, that we have on the reef. And that's just one location on the reef that we're looking at growth. Of course, So yeah. the more you look into it, the more layers yeah. of complexity there are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you have a favourite coral? Yeah. <laughs> I do. I think it's uh, Platygyra. Uh, so that was one of the species that I studied the yeah. growth of during oh, my PhD. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, mm. There's another one called Stylophora and it has a little crab that lives inside oh, the that's adorable. branches of the oh. coral. Um, so they, they help each other out. Um, the crab will eat off any algae that grows on the coral. <laughs> and then the coral is so providing cute. the crab a home. So that's, <gasps> that's another favourite. That's so cute. They're like best friends. They're like besties. <laughs> <laughs> so you are now working at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. AIMS. AIMS. That's the acronym That's the use. acronym. <laughs> How did that transition from being a PhD person at... CSIRO to being postdoctorate there? Yeah, no, it's been really interesting to make that transition. Uh, so the Australian Institute of Marine Science is a tropical marine research agency. So um, a lot of what they work with is similar to what I did during my PhD. Mm. They study marine systems from Ningaloo right around the top end and on the Great Barrier Reef as well. So I've been able to apply a lot of what I learned in my PhD to these new systems that I'm studying now. So I now um, look at the Great Barrier Reef, which oh, wow. is a very different system. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A very large system. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been really interesting to see the contrast between Ning Ningaloo and the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, mm, definitely. And does the research that you're doing now feel like a bit of an extension of what you did on your PhD or is it kind of different? Uh, no, I'd say it does feel like an extension of my PhD work, uh, but expanding out and working with a lot of other people as well. So bringing together different types of expertise. So what we're trying to do now is build a population model for corals. Mm -hmm. So with this model, we want to be able to describe and predict how coral populations will change over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, we need some of the types of information that I collected during my PhD. So these things like growth and survival, rate, mm -hmm. uh, survival rates of corals. Um, but we also need other things. We need to know um, what disturbances are occurring at a site. We also need to know connectivity, so that's about if a coral um, reproduces, it will release its reproductive material into the water column, and then these can move around, so they can travel to other reefs and start oh, wow. a new population. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so corals are an interesting uh, species to make a population model for. I, I think everyone's aware of populations as a concept I mean yeah, we're part yeah. of a population uh, so with people you might be able to move from one population to another by driving your car to a different town for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you then become or if you move house you become part of a different population mm -hmm. corals are sessile organisms so they stay in one location they can't move uh, yeah and yeah. so when we think about connectivity between coral populations it's when they reproduce that's how they can contribute to other oh. populations interesting so these it's are the so kind weird of to think about yeah. that coral is actually alive and they do reproduce mm. and yeah definitely. grow <laughs> no, definitely. I, yeah i think they're often described as a plant animal and yeah. a rock <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah but technically they are an animal <laughs> wow that's, yeah. so cool. that's crazy and so when you're measuring or sort of tracking the population of coral is climate change a huge factor, factor in that yes climate change is kind of this big dark cloud over everything <laughs> that i do it's really what will structure coral reefs is already structuring coral yeah. reefs mm. uh, so we we really need to have a uh, handle on what are the impacts of climate change yeah and with my work now we're looking 
to how can we help the reef um, withstand the effects mm-hmm. of climate change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Obviously, when you were studying at Ningaloo, did that even factor in the climate change or did it kind of come later? Uh, definitely on the radar all the time mm-hmm. um, with coral reefs as, yeah, corals are one of the most sensitive organisms that we're seeing <laughs> responding to climate change um, on a really uh, big scale. So Ningaloo has been fairly lucky, I suppose you could say, in yep. that it mm-hmm. hasn't had um, too many major um, temperature stress events or that's these marine good. heat waves. That's so that's contrasted with the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Uh, we've seen four mass coral bleaching events in the last wow. six years. Mm. So that's kind of meaning it's more likely to have a year with a with a marine heat wave than to have one without. Yeah, so that's yeah. a massive concern. This frequency. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Do you think like more tourists going to the Great Barrier Reef rather than Ningaloo Reef would that affect it as well? Um, it it could, but n- not not in, really not in, not relative to yeah. the impacts of right. climate change, which are just so much bigger mm. in magnitude. Of uh, course. Yeah. 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 So with that population model, is that kind of connected to climate change as well? Like obviously the population, which ones get more affected or that type of thing? Yeah, that's right. So um, with the population modelling, we need to understand how the disturbances impact Mm. the population. So this can be via um, killing the corals and then they're removed from the population in that way. And that can happen through marine heat waves or cyclones or um, a crown of thorns starfish. There's these different ways that um, corals can be killed and many of them are linked to climate change. So Mm. that's definitely a big... We heard from Logan in the previous episode mm-hmm. that the crown of thorn starfish has just yes. been found on Ningaloo. Really? Okay. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. in my five years visiting Ningaloo during uh, my PhD, uh, yeah, we maybe saw one or two, but it's yeah. very rare. Mm. Um, whereas on the Great Barrier Reef, there are much more present. Uh, okay. Threat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So with your population models and how you're monitoring the coral, what sort of data do you need to go out and collect in order to sort of track it, monitor it? <laughs> That's Yeah, okay. So I think a lot of what I learnt and did during my PhD informed um, what needs to go into these types of models mm-hmm. in order to really capture what is likely to happen into the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Ningaloo Outlook, uh, project collects all sorts of different types of data that are really important. So there's something that we call demographic data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's about um, processes like the growth and survival and reproduction of corals. We need to know all of those to be able to make a coral population model. Mm-hmm. But then there's broader things about measuring the population itself. So with this um For example, the Ningaloo Outlook project returns to the same sites year after year and looks at things like the diversity of corals, how much coral cover is there relative to other things like algae or Mm. um, bare substrate. And then from that, we can feed that into the model as well. Mm -hmm. So we can start to look at how well we're following the population trajectories over time. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about the Reef Restoration Adaptation Program that you're currently working on? Yes. So it's the world's largest effort to help a significant ecosystem survive the effects of climate change. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So it's very big scale. It's across multiple institutions, including CSIRO, Ames, where I work, and the University of Queensland. So it's about acknowledging that Um, We have this extreme threat from climate change, which is impacting our coral reefs. um, And the program is mainly focused on the the Great Barrier Reef as this giant ecosystem that they want to try um, and help. So it's about recognising that we have these extreme impacts from climate change, which are killing um, large areas of the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. 
and even if we are to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions which we really need to do to have any hope of <laughs> yeah. seeing the Great Barrier Reef um, in 50 years um, we also need to help it um, increase its resilience so mm -hmm. this links back to the work I did in my PhD yeah, okay. um, so about increasing its capacity to withstand a marine heat wave yeah. and helping fast track its recovery from some of those impacts mm -hmm. So that's what the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program is trying to do, looking at ways to enhance coral's ability to withstand um, temperature stress, and then looking at ways, if you've got a damaged section of reef, how can you help it recover? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ideally you want to help one section recover and see flow on benefits to surrounding Other reefs sections. or yeah. surrounding areas. Yeah. I just keep thinking of putting sunscreen on the coral and then yeah. aloe vera on <laughs> it <laughs> if it gets too hot. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> drink some water. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so a, a big thing, a big challenge is that there are things that can be done at quite small scales, for, yeah. like that, for <laughs> yeah. example. Um, but what we really need is something at a really big scale of course, because yeah. the Great Barrier Reef is massive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so big. Yes. Uh, maybe like a real stretch, but do we kind of know what that solution is yet or is that what we're working towards yes that's what the reef restoration program is working towards yeah. trying to understand yeah. what options have we got on the table how might we implement these uh, the work i do is then modeling before we actually go out to the reef and try okay. some of these things okay yeah oh, okay yeah so you're like coming up with the ideas that they then go test uh i'm not coming up with the ideas so much as testing the ideas okay so yeah okay. if we've got um we call them interventions yeah so if we've got this um thing we can put out onto the reef uh, mm. an example is cloud brightening mm. so um if we know there was going to be a marine heat wave, we could put this device on the reef and it would decrease the temperature stress in a particular area. Okay. Okay. Um, these these are all ideas that ideas. are just being built, but with the uh, model, uh, I can do things to look at well, how much benefit would that actually get? Mm -hmm. uh, where should we put that to increase the benefit? Uh, so yeah. we don't want to put it in a place where the next year it's going to get hit by a cyclone or something yeah. like that okay so we yeah there's a lot of um, spatial work in terms of understanding where to put things and then when to put them as well yeah okay yeah. I feel like the cute crabs and the cor coral should get priority oh. yeah. there's yeah. two of them yeah in every one <laughs> no that's another complexity in, in terms of we need to consider what the reef means to different people what different people <laughs> yes. want to protect some people want to protect <laughs> the corals with their crabs but other people might want to protect a particular patch where they like to visit yeah. for their tourism or yeah. go fishing the stuff that, that looks pretty the yeah stuff that looks pretty yeah, yeah. All right, so um, previously you worked on the Ningali Reef and now you're predominantly focused on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, how do those two differ in your research and your findings? Yeah, it's been really interesting uh, making the transition from my PhD where I focused on Ningaloo Reef, which is a fringing reef, so mm -hmm. it runs along the coast, Yeah, uh, which makes it really special for visiting because you can just get go to the beach dive in and you're on the reef straight away yeah wow um it's quite interesting too because it's on a very dry coastline so it's pretty yeah. much desert meeting the ocean yeah mm -hmm. uh, that means it has different um pressures to the great barrier reef mm -hmm. um so when we go to the great barrier reef we're dealing with a much larger uh, system it's the world's largest living organism <laughs> <laughs> and it is made up of um, many individual reefs. I think there's more than three uh, three thousand reefs. Wow, wow, that's a lot. That's so with Ningaloo, we've got much more of a continuous reef yeah. running down the coastline. With the Great Barrier Reef, we've got all these individual reefs, mm -hmm. and they're a lot further offshore as well. Yeah. Mm. So that means they're experiencing very different um, conditions, very yeah. different environments, and so when we look at modeling what's happening in those two different systems we have to consider d different variables but that said there's a huge amount of overlap and I think a lot um, that I learned at Ningaloo can be applied to the reefs I'm now modeling yeah on the Great Barrier mm. Reef 
I know they're two very different, would I say, climates, but can you see um, the same population of species in both or are they got completely separate no, kind of yeah, species? No, yeah, I think there is a lot of overlap. Coral taxonomy is... Um, is a challenge. There's yeah. the species that you'll see on the Great Barrier Reef that look very similar to the species that you see on Ningaloo, but they're not necessarily the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, even though historically it's thought they were the same species. Yeah. Um, okay. So what made you want to study marine science in the first place? Uh, I actually have two parents who are marine scientists. Oh, wow. So wow. That Continuing probably the had tradition. a bit of an impact. Um, yeah. yeah, my dad is an oceanographer and my mum wow. studied microalgae. Wow. Um, but I think also growing up in Tasmania, spending a lot of time in and around the ocean as yeah. a child mm-hmm. has a huge impact. Definitely. And then the, the third reason is probably a bit left field. I read uh, Tim Winton's book, blew back when oh, I was yeah. 14 oh, wow. had a really yeah. big impact on me becoming a marine scientist I yeah think. Wow. I love that yeah no books can be really good for that actually yeah <laughs> yeah Tim Winston was actually just in Perth he was doing Perth Festival this year yeah oh really yeah. bit of a fan <laughs> yeah <laughs> I believe you've got a year ish left of your post doctorate what does the future look like for you? Uh, it's still a bit blurry. Can't quite make it out in any detail. <laughs> That's always uh, the way. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I've really been enjoying the work that I've been doing recently w- in the restoration space and really trying to understand how we can help the Great Barrier Reef. So I think I will continue in that area. Uh, I'll probably continue doing modelling, but uh, I do love getting out onto the reef and spending time underwater. So I need yeah, to find a balance yeah, where definitely. I can definitely, definitely less time on the computer, yeah. more time in the ocean. More time in the ocean. Right. <laughs> yep. I feel like I need the computer work to put all these complex processes together in one place, mm. but I need the field work to of remind course. myself why I'm doing marine science. Yeah, of course. Yes. Fair enough. Is there um, a future in which you come back to Ningaloo? I hope so. Like I said, it's a place that keeps drawing me back. I find it a really interesting system. Uh, So yes, I think I'll be back at Ningaloo before too long. It's very exciting. That's very exciting. (laughs) Okay, well, thanks for coming in and chatting to us. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me. Always. Anytime. (laughs)